I invite you to stand, if you will, <clears throat> and turn to a Old Testament minor prophet book of Jonah, chapter 3. Sometimes I think when you have your plans all laid out, God laughs. This week in which I thought God had directed me on a certain sermon late in a week, He just changed my mind. And here's what we get. But I really feel like this is the message God wanted me to preach for this hour. Father, we ask you Lord, in this room, no doubt there are those that struggle. And maybe, Lord, there's one that needs a Savior. Father, we can look far and wide in the world today and not find anything in the world close to what you offer an individual. And that's your peace. Lord, we came here not to play games, not just to occupy a set time of a service, but Father, we came here to brag on you. Lord, I know that in my physical body, I do not give you much. But Father, I'm trusting that you'll speak through me. And Lord, that you deliver the word in which you have given me. Father, I appreciate what you've taught me this week and what you allowed me to see. And Father, in some small way, I pray that I would be able to convey that to these good people. For the next few minutes, Lord, I pray that we would listen. We would heed. And we would let you have control. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Here's a loaded question, but let me ask you from the very outset of this message. Have you ever messed up, made a mistake, or totally messed a deadline? Have you ever just made a mistake? And the overriding answer would certainly be yes. Have you ever wished that you could go back and undo some wrong that you did? Yeah, we all have done things we regret. Some were our fault, and for sure, and maybe some mistakes were caused by others, but it affected you. Have you ever thought what it would be like to have your record of your past deeds totally wiped clean? How about a start over? All of this would be nice, but how do you start over? You cannot turn back the clock, but allow me to give you a major truth today. I'm not going to try to fill your mind with a lot of facts and figures, but there's one central truth that as I was reading the Bible this week in my devotions, I probably have, have read this a thousand times, but it did not affect me like it did this week. And I want to show it to you here in just a moment. Human nature tells us or gives us what they think is fair. For instance, if your neighbor gets a new table saw, then certainly you deserve one as well. I would have to say that. If your co-worker gets a raise... Well, certainly, you ought to be entitled to one as well, or so you think. You see, sometimes our sense of justice is not equal to reality. Or how about a convicted felon who gets a second chance and seems to have everything that you don't? All of us relate fairness to how it affects us. If it is fair to us, then that's all that matters. For instance, if you get stopped for speeding out on American Boulevard and you get a ticket and your friend the next day does the very same speed and gets a warning, here's what you think. That's not fair. But can I tell you this, and I think we all know this, will we agree this morning that the Lord knows what's fair and what's not? But I want you to look at something. I want you to look at Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 10, and I just want you to see something that so gravitated my attention this week that it stayed with me for several days, and let me show it. 
God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that He that He said He would do unto them. And He did it not. But if you have a pen this morning, I want you to underscore, He did it not. I want you to think about that because that's one thing that I want to carry throughout this whole message this morning. If you don't get anything else this morning, I want you to remember that one phrase, and He did it not. You see, Jonah was going to Nineveh or did not want to go to Nineveh because he, quite frankly, rather have that place nuked. He wanted them dead because Nineveh was as evil as any nation on the face of the earth. As Babylon would capture a nation, they would hang their corpses on their fences. And listen to this. If the city would dare resist a takeover, there was certain punishment from the uh, from the Babylonians. One Babylonian king wrote this, I flayed as many nobles as rebelled against me and draped their skins over the pile of corpses. Some I spread out within the pile and others I erected upon the pile. I flayed many and draped their skins over my walls. And another statement were read like this, I captive, I, 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 I captive many troops alive. I cut off some of their arms and their hands and their noses and their ears. I gouged out their eyes of many troops. I made a pile of the living and I made a pile of the heads. I hung their heads on trees around the city. And not to mention what the Babylonians would do to the women that they captured. They were ruthless and they were bloodthirsty. And all of the horrors that were done, the throats were cut and Reports that uh, that I did some research on when they would capture somebody and just for the sheer enjoyment of it, they would place somebody down on the street and let the horses just stomp them to death. What the Babylon, Bab, Bab, Babylonians thought or the Assyrians thought was fun was just more blood and more blood and more blood. You see, at that particular time in history, no one could stand up to the Babylonians. No one had the power or the ability to tell them no. And if they come to conquer your nation, all you could do was submit. You dare not go against them, because if you did, your punishment would be far greater. We know that in the book of Nineveh, in our Bibles, is our modern-day Iraq. Everybody knows that. So a call to go to Nineveh went against the grain of a Jewish prophet like Jonah. He did not want to do that. He understood the horrors that these people inflicted upon the Jewish people, and he had no desire, watch this, he had no desire to go to that Gentile nation. Listen to me. He did not want to go there because he did not want to preach to them because he did not want them people saved. Now think about that just for a moment. In Jonah chapter 1, verse number 2, this is not going to be a Jonah message necessarily, but I want to set the stage. In Jonah chapter 1, verse number 2, it says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, huge, huge, several hundreds of thousands of people in that city, and cry against it. Now watch this. For their wickedness has come before me. Guess who me is in that verse? It's God Himself. Jonah wanted God to pour out His wrath on them. He did not want God to welcome them. God told Jonah to go and preach salvation to them. And Jonah's reaction? Well, not me, God. Not only do I not want to go, but I can't stand them. Not only do I not want them to salvation, but quite frankly, God, I hate them. You know why? Because I know what they are. Come on, somebody with me. I know what they are. I know what they stand for. And Lord, I don't love them because they don't love me. You see, ancient Jews believe that God loved them and them alone. Now, had God told the prophet to go to a Jewish city, then things might have been different. But not to this wicked and vile city. Every Jew knew what these pagans stood for, and every Jew knew their crimes. And Jonah was furious that God would even suggest he go to such a place like this. And before you start to daydream, go back to Jonah chapter 1 and verse number 2 and underscore this word. The Bible says, God understood their wickedness. Now watch this. God understood their wickedness. So why would God... Is somebody with me so far? 
Why would God go to Iraq and tell somebody to go to those people? They're wicked. They're vile. They have no use for you, God. I don't want to go. So why would God do that? By the way, God says this in, 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 in verse number two. Look, he says, I know their wickedness has come up before me. In other words, here's what God said. You don't have to tell me, Jonah, how wicked they are. Come on, come on, come on. Because I already know it. Now, I want to interject this before we go on. Lest we sit here and think that we're so much better, and that we're better than the Iraqis, or the Ninevites, or Babylonian, can I show you something? In Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, he makes it clear. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that why we were yet in Nineveh, why we were yet Babylonians, do you see where we're going? Christ died for us. Can I tell you something this morning? Sin is sin. And I know that you and I classify that. I get that. I do the same thing. But can I tell you, in the eyes of God, we are just as bad as the Babylonians. In the eyes of God, we're hopeless without any, without any cure. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God jumped my way, came my way, and showed me something that I needed. He showed me that without Jesus Christ, there is no hope. Maybe this verse will make sense to you in Jonah chapter 1, verse number 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. And I want you to understand, if you have your Bibles to Jonah 1, 3, you'll see something interesting. Twice, it's interesting that he would say this twice. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish, watch this, from the presence of the Lord. At the bottom of that verse, it says, to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. See, can I tell you this? He had no desire to do that. He did not want to go out and cry against it. What would make this extra stre- stressful was that Jonah would be a very lonely voice crying in that city. Now think about this. Are, are we here this morning? Come on, come on. If Jonah would have had a Jeremiah or an Ezekiel, if Jonah would have had a prophet that would have been there with him, maybe, 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 maybe he might have thought, I might want to go. But here's what he understood. I'm going to be the only one. I'm, I'm going to be the one doing this, God. And quite frankly, not only do I not love them, not only do I not want to speak to them, not only do I not want them saved, I'm going to be the only one. And I, God, here's what I think is going to happen. You're going to send me there and they're going to kill me. Now, why wouldn't he think that? C- come on, why wouldn't he think that? Because listen, that's all they knew. If there, if there comes a preacher down the street and he's preaching repentance, can I tell you, a lot of people don't like that. That's right. By the way, we don't like it today. That's right. So here comes, here, here comes old Jonah down there and eventually, you know the story how he got there, but eventually he, he, he does do what God wants him to do, but very, very, very reluctantly. Something that you probably take for granted and I take for granted, it's this. God loves you as He loves His pagan nation. Well, God, I don't love people that way. Well, no, you can't, but you can through God. See, sometimes we have it all wrong. You see, it is easy to love the lovable. Look at this verse, Luke 6.32. And see if this don't help you a little bit this morning. Luke 6, 32. For if you love them which love you, what think you have? For sinners also love them that love them. You know what the bottom line to that verse was? Listen, everybody can love the lovable, but it takes the love of Christ for you and I to love those that are unlovable. Hey, somebody amen that. Wow. I like this because... I think so many of us would kind of be in this same situation and given a chance. Let me just show you something. It's it's sort of kind of humorous and it's sort of kind of not. But look, look if you will, at Luke chapter 9, verse 52. Luke chapter 9, verse number 52. Isn't this so human nature? And sent messengers before His face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for Him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. 
And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they says, Lord, now watch this, underscore this, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elijah did? But he's talking about Jesus here. But he turned and rebuked him and says, You don't know what manner of spirit you are. For the Son of Man, underscore this, is not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. Yeah, and they went to another village. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, can, I can just think this. You, you have to understand the disciples, I think they meant it well. It just did not come out well. Jesus is going through this Samaritan village and here's they have so much zeal and Jesus is with them and those people did not want anything to do with Jesus and so the Johns and the Peters said something like this, Hey Lord, why don't you just, why don't you just nuke them? Just, just send fire down from heaven and boy, we don't have to fool with these rebellious people anymore. Can, can I tell you what Jesus must have thought? Guys, you're still not getting this. Guys, you're still far from where you need to be. Listen, I'm not come to destroy men's life. I'm not coming to, to, to do that. I want everybody to know who I am. I want everybody to have a chance at this thing called gospel salvation. Yeah. I want everybody, whether you like them or not, I want them to come and know me as Savior. Now, l- listen, let's be all truthful, and, and, and I fall into this category. There's some people that we all don't like. And here's what we think. Well, they deserve what they get. Well, now, wait a minute. Let's not go on deserve what we get because if we're going on that timeline, we all could deserve a whole lot worse than what... So here's what, here's what's going on. He's sending him to, 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 to this sick, wicked city of Nineveh, the bloodthirsty city. He eventually goes and he, he does those things that God wants him to do. But at the end of the book of Jonah, you'll have to read it. He did not, he did not like it and he just sat and pouted for the rest of his life. I don't know the rest of his life, but he did have a pity party there at the book, at the end of the book of Jonah. And by the way, it's probably, listen to this. It's probably possible that Jonah knew people that those Babylonians had tortured. It's probably not only possible, it's probably he might have had even some family member. I don't know this. He might have even had some friends that was captured by these brutal people and that they beheaded or they, they mutilated in some way. And so you can understand his, 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 his call to inaction because he understood this. They violated the Jews. They, they did all these horrible things. And now God wants me to go there. <laughs> I like this. In Jonah 3, 4, and Jonah began to enter that city a day's journey. And he cried, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Can I tell you this? What a difference. What was his message? 40 days. 40 days. 40 days. Do you think the people got sick of hearing that? Up and down those massive streets. Up and down the lanes of the city. Forty days and you're going to get it. Now he might have enjoyed saying that. But in verse number five, the Bible says, so the people of Nineveh believe God. Now let me stop here and I'll hurry for this next section. But let me stop here. I was reading this and I was writing and and, and taking some notes. And I paused and put my pen down, and here's what I thought. The Bible says that the people believed God. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You would naturally assume that maybe because this guy was running up and down the streets and screaming that message and all of this, you would think in the natural mindset that they might have said, and the people believed Jonah, which means this. Because the Bible says the people believe God, that just meant his preaching was more dynamic than we give him credit for. Because here's what he was saying. Nowhere in that scripture does it say they believe what Jonah's saying. No, no, no. They believe in Jonah's God. And can I tell you, in order for the Bible to say that, his preaching had to be with power. His preaching had to be with conviction. His preaching had to be with something that probably they had never seen. As a matter of fact, it is said that that was the greatest revival in the history of the world. Many hundreds of thousands of people came to know the Lord. Why? It's because this reluctant prophet eventually says, I'll go, but I don't want to go. 
Kind of like you this morning. I'll go to church, but I don't want to go to church. That's all right. Before you leave, you might just accidentally back into a truth that can help you. I just thought that was interesting. Now, we've established, and He did it not. You see, God, whoa, 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 look. God could have wiped Nineveh out, right? He could have just sent a nuclear bomb and says, you're done. He could have done it. But the Bible makes this plain, and He did it not. That has repercussions for you and I. Can I show you something in the New Testament? Meaning, because He did it not, because God spared them, listen, He did not overthrow Babylon, but He wanted to spare them. And let me just show you a verse in Scripture that ought to, ought to make us pause a moment. Because we think we know a little bit more than that, that we wouldn't do that, what God did for Nineveh. Look at Isaiah chapter 55, verse number 8. For my thoughts, watch, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Look at verse number 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, watch, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. So would we concede this morning that God probably knows a little bit more than we do? We should be grateful that the Lord did it not. You see, we see others of having no value, but God sees something differently. Listen, when we look at people, when we look at people, we automatically make a judgment call. Let me, let me just show you this. When Matt goes to a place and he walks in, they're going to make a judgment call on him. When you walk into the place and it's a strange place, guess what? They make a judgment call on you. Listen, I hate to say this, but we're all guilty of that. Yeah. How do I know that? Just go to Walmart. No, I'm, I'm teasing. I, 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 I'm, all right, just forget that. But we make judgment calls. By the way, God... Loves the undesirables. And He loves the unlovables. I'm going to prove something to you this morning. How God broke a tradition or broke a social norm. And He was ridiculed for this. If you have your Bibles, I'll invite your attention. And let's parse this story out so that you get it. In Luke chapter 7, verse number 38. I want to show you something. Luke chapter 7, verse number 38. And stood at his feet be, uh, behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears. And did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Skip down to verse number 44, if you will. Skip down to verse number 44. And he turned, Jesus, talking about Jesus, he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? Question. I entered into thy house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou uh, didst not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I say unto her, watch, underscore, her sins which are, circle that, many are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. That's a powerful statement. In verse number 37, she is introduced, underscore this, if you'll go up to verse number 37, she's introduced in this story simply as a sinner. For those that gathered, they knew her past. They wanted nothing to do with her. But thank God Jesus did not discard her. Why did He not throw her away? Why would Jesus even put up with somebody like this? Why would Jesus put up with somebody that had a sorry reputation that, that society says, I don't want? Why didn't, listen, why did he just condemn her? Because he did it not. Because he loved the unlovables. Listen, he loves you as much as he loves the Babylonians. He loves you as much as he did this sinful woman. Follow me with this. In Luke chapter 7, verse number 35, 39, when the Pharisee which bid him saw it, he spake within himself, he's just thinking these words, this man, if he, if he were a prophet, would, watch this, I love this part, would have known 
who and what manner of woman this is that touches him. Look, for she is a what? Sinner. Can you imagine this, this respected or so-called respected Jew that went overboard on this cleanliness, and you don't have to get to all that story, I don't have time to develop it. But they were so worried about their cleanliness, and they didn't want to touch anything that was undefiled. They didn't want anything in their house undefiled. So for some reason, this man Simon, not not Peter, but another man by the name of Simon, was throwing this party. Jesus shows up, and how this woman got into the party, I don't know. But she got into the party, and she was lavishing her love and affection on Jesus. And here's what they're saying. Don't he know who this is? Watch this, watch this. Here's my part. Why would Jesus even let her touch him? The nerve of him. What gives him the right to let this nasty, filthy, dirty, sin-crested woman touch him? Jesus, you've got to be out of your living mind. Don't you know who she is? By the way, let me answer that question for you. Yes. He knew who she was, and he allowed that to happen. Why? Don't you believe that was an object lesson for those people that was in that house? Jesus used that and says, listen to me, Pharisees, can I tell you? The custom of the day was when people went into the house, they would have a servant come and they would wash the feet, they would anoint the head, and they would take care of the guests. But when Jesus went into that house, that man Simon had no servant to wash the feet, no ser- uh, servant to do the social norms of the day. This sinful woman came and she did so, but she did so with her tears. Can I tell you, she had something figured out. She said this, I'm not too bad that Jesus won't love me. There is some... Watch, watch this. There is something within this man that I need. There's something different about him. Why? Because he lets me touch him. See, everybody knew her reputation. Everybody knew who she was. But it didn't matter to Jesus because he came to seek and to save those which were lost. By the way... You and I come into the world lost without Christ. We're born into this world needing a Savior. And by the way, can I tell you, there's a hole in your heart. If you're here lost and you don't know the Savior, there's something in your heart that begs you to know the question about who Jesus is, about this eternal life, and about this life after we die. Is that real? Can that be real? Let me let me answer that question. Yes, it's real. And by the way, listen... If you're here and you're undone, you're lost, you walked into this building and said, Preacher, I've never had a relationship with Christ. Quite frankly, I don't even know what you're talking about. It don't even apply to me. Well, let me tell you this. Not only does it apply to you, and beloved, if you don't know this, then you're going to suffer for all time eternity for this. And let, let, let me give you this. Let me give you this. And, and I'm hurry, 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 preacher. I desire this morning, through the Holy Spirit's help, to make sure that everybody walked in this room and that when everybody left out of this room, they would know one central truth. That either you know who Jesus is and you have a relationship with Him or you're lost and undone and you choose not to accept the eternal gift that God's offering you this morning. My job every Sunday is to brag on Jesus. There's never exploits that I could do that that would take the place of Jesus. There's nothing that the best thing that you've ever done falls way short of the glory of God. There's nothing that we could do to match His holiness and His splendor. I'm just glad that He opened up salvation to us Gentiles just like He did the Ninevites. Thank God for that. But this sinful woman touched Him. And those people were going crazy about that. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. By the way, you ought to put your name in that verse right there because you're part of that verse. Let me show you one other thing and then I'll go. If all that's amazing, look at Matthew chapter 8. Matter of fact, this was against all customs of the day and Jesus broke another custom. Look, if you will, at Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 1. When He was come down from the mountains, watch this, Great multitudes followed him. How many is a multitude? Have no idea. But a lot of people was around Jesus. And look, and behold, there came a leper. Now watch this. 
and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now watch this. And Jesus put forth his hand, uh oh, here's that word again, and touched him. I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Listen, this was another desperate person coming to Jesus. Then Jesus did something that no scribe or Pharisee would have ever been caught doing. He reached out and touched him. Now, no clean person would ever do that. If a leopard would come close to a clean person, it was usually, it was usually by accident. And listen to this, the clean people would usually throw rocks or throw objects at that individual because a leprosy was considered one of the worst type of defilements you could have. Not only was this guy the very worst of the worst, nobody wanted him. Nobody would touch him. Nobody would speak to him. And can you imagine how he had to find his food? Somebody grunt or something this morning. Can you imagine how he had to survive? Nobody, would, you, you couldn't get near the population. They would throw rocks at you, throw objects at you, or throw insults at you. You couldn't even get close to somebody. But listen to this. Jesus looked at him. And he touched him. Now I want to tell you this. I guarantee here's what happened when Jesus did that. There were some people that did this. <laughs> There's people that did that because you, listen, a clean Jew would never touch anything defiled. And listen to this. Can you imagine what this guy smelled like? Rotting flesh. Can you imagine what he looked like with parts of his skin falling off? Leprosy sores running everywhere. Probably might have had his face covered just to shield his ugliness. By the way, that's exactly the picture of sin. Is our ugliness. Some of us are in this room are trying to conceal it this morning. You're trying to make your sin a little bit prettier than it actually is. You'll put on deodorant, you'll put on aftershave or perfume, whatever the case may be. Why? Because you want everybody to know that your sin does not smell that bad. But Jesus went over and touched that leper, and all of these Jews was astonished by this. He should not do that. Why didn't God condemn him? He did it not. Why didn't God send him to hell? He did it not. Why did God love him? He Listen, he did what he did because of this individual, and he knew this. Listen, this, watch, 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 watch. This one man is worth my time. Now, God is worth your time. He wants to invade Calvary Baptist Church Auditorium this morning. And watch this. Watch. And touch you. Some of you might have had a a touch of a fuzzy feeling before in your life. That's what we're talking about. Some of you might have gone to a church and you've been real convicted over your sins and, and, and you, and you think, well, I need to do something about that. I'm talking about a touch that can be a life changing situation for you. Something that when you leave this building, you can look back on and say, that was something that was incredible that Jesus did for me. Why? Because I know who I am. Can you picture this scene as this leper went home? And by the way, can, can, I, can I tell you something real quick? Come, 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 come. <laughs> Jesus told him to go show himself to the priest. Now, I thought about that, and here's the, here's the kicker that you might not know. If, if you had leprosy and you went to the priest, you had to do all of these kind of strange things. For instance, uh, you had to go br- get two live birds, a piece of cedar wood, a bunch of hyssop, some scarlet threads, and you had to bring all of that to the priest saying you were healed by Jesus. Now, the s- significant thing about that is in the Bible, come on, come on, come on, come on. In the Bible, nobody ever went to the priest to do these things. Why? Because nobody was healed of leprosy save one in the Old Testament. Yeah. And can you imagine this priest went home and told his wife, you ain't going to believe this. I had a guy that came to me and said he was healed by Jesus. Well, I don't know what to do. It's, I went and checked, checked the roll book and ain't nobody ever done that before. Amen. So what do we do? Huh, can I tell you? What do you think this happened to this guy? 
What do you think happened to those people that understood what exactly happened? I, I, I just can't imagine this. Let me tell you this. Jesus was not looking for those in power or those who could give back to Him. He wasn't in search of a donor, benefactor, or a biggest platform. Jesus was in search of opportunities to offer grace and mercy, and that is what He offers you today. This leads back to you. Can I tell you this? Let me skip that. In, in 2 Peter chapter 3, it's an amazing verse. And I wish all people would understand this. And if you don't get anything else as I close, make this a part of your understanding. Second Peter chapter 3. Look at verse number 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. Look at this. But is long-suffering. In other words, He has patience for you. Look at this last part of that verse. He's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. This is where you fit in this message. You have been given an opportunity for an unspeakable gift of eternal life. The gift cannot be measured in dollars or cents. But let me ask you this question. Do you know Him as Savior? On a Saturday night in 1998, a lady by the name of Zita turned down an invitation to go with some of her friends and instead she went for a jog. Along the way, one of her dogs by the name of Tango stopped to smell and scratch the dirt on the trail. She went to investigate and saw two feet poking out of the ground. At first she thought it was an animal. Then she heard the baby cry. Azita started digging and found a baby, baby wrapped in a blue towel. Lifting him into her arms, she cleared dirt from his nose and his mouth. And she kept telling that little baby, please don't die, please don't die. I will never leave you, I will never leave you, please don't die. She flagged down a passing motorist who contacted the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. As he, as they waited for the police and the paramedics to arrive, she tried to comfort the baby the best that she could. He grabbed my wrist and stopped crying. It was, it was so emotional. What kind of sick human would do something like that, she thought. He still had his umbilical cord hanging from his stomach. The baby's body temperature had fallen to 80 degrees. At the hospital, he was treated for severe hypothermia. In time, he made a remarkable recovery. The neonatal medical director at Huntington Memorial Hospital called it really almost a miracle. Nurses named him Baby Christian. In time, the baby was adopted. His parents named him Matthew Christian Whitaker. He, when he was 17 years old, Matthew learned that he was adopted. He was told how he was found. But none of that changed his feelings about his upbringing. And he said these words, I'm here today. I've lived a great life. I was adopted into a great family, Whitaker said. I couldn't ask my parents for any more. He doesn't dwell on the person who left him. If this was your best idea, he says, to leave me here, then thanks. Maybe you were not fit to raise a child. Twenty years after he found, twenty years after she found the baby, Azita and Whitaker were finally tearfully and joyfully reunited. They shared the stories of their lives since that fateful day. And then she took Whitaker to the hiking trail where, where she found him, growing quite and serious, Matthew stared through a chain link fence at that spot. This could have been my grave, he said, to which Azita replied, you were simply wanted. This morning, God has did everything in His power to want you, yeah, amen. to love you, and to offer you peace that passes all understanding. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? This precious gift that God is offering to us this morning, do you know that gift of eternal life? Has there been a time in your life where you said, God, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I'm undone.
Lord, there's something in my heart that's been crying for weeks and months and maybe years. There's something that's never been right in my relationships, in my thought life, and even in my personal life. Lord, I don't ever feel like I've ever been wanted. My friend, when you come to Jesus, oh, your life changes. There's an opportunity for you to experience things that you'll never, ever experience. Do you know Christ as your eternal Lord and Savior? Jesus died on the cross for you. He was buried and three days later, He walked out of that tomb, meaning this, meaning every one of your sins was placed on Him. He had victory over your sins and mine. And one of these days when we trust Him as Savior, we too will have that resurrected life. We too will experience the joys of Christ personally. But until He comes, being a Christian, you can experience that joy on earth. You can have a relationship with Him. You can walk with Him. Pray with Him. Study about Him. Learn of Him. And learn how your life can be turned overnight. I challenge you. I plead with you. I beg you. Do not leave this room without knowing a a relationship with Christ. Going with a Christless eternity is what the devil's trying to convince you this morning. It's not worth it. He's a liar, he's a thief, and he's a destroyer. Christ has come, the Bible says, that you may have life and have it more abundantly. This morning in this special place, in this special invitation, who would say, Preacher, I just don't know. I don't know whether or not I know Christ is my Savior. Are you willing to gamble your fate on that? Would you allow me to show you from the Bible how you can have peace, how you can have a new relationship, how your life can be brand new? We're offering you this. We're offering you to trade the old for the new. We're offering to give you peace, grace, and mercy. Not we, but Christ is. Would somebody this morning say, Preacher, I need that. I need to reach out to Him because, quite frankly, preacher, the way that I'm going is not getting me anywhere. You keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That's called insanity. You're not going to have different results if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over. Would you allow Christ to do something this morning? Father, I pray. Lord, in this special hour, in this special time, we saw how Jesus loved the unlovables. Not only did He love them, He enjoyed being Lord, their Lord and Savior. He enjoyed having a relationship with them. And that same Lord that offered salvation to the, to the woman that was a sinner, to a woman that was far removed from society, Jesus loved her and saved her. For the leper that was condemned already by the society and was thrown rocks at and insulted, Jesus loved him. That same love extends to you. Father, in this moment, would you do something that human cannot do? Would you burden a soul, make it heavy on their heart, that they not leave this room without knowing you as Savior? Today, Lord, it could be a day of open door. I pray, Lord, that your spirit will have full control. In Jesus' name, would you stand with me all over the building? Maybe you need to come pray for a lost relative, a lost loved one. Maybe you here that are lost and undone and you need a relationship. Don't let this escape you. Don't let this moment flee. Don't listen to the devil. Don't listen. Preacher, I don't want to be embarrassed. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm going to show you what Jesus said. I would never embarrass you. This is your moment. This is your time.